Hello. Today, I would like to tell you about hyphens, apostrophes, and other, I used to say, miscellaneous punctuation marks that we sometimes use in English. In all cases, helps us make our writing more clear. Okay, the hyphen is the single short horizontal line raised the, uh, to the middle of the word space, and it's approximately half the length of a dash. In fact, uh, if you think about it, if you type two hyphens on most word processors, they'll, they'll combine to form a dash. So um, it's half the length of a dash, and we've already talked about those, and hyphens are placed within words, including compound words. So for example, president-elect, that would be a hyphen. Whereas dashes go between words. John, his own flesh and blood, did that to him. Okay, his own flesh and blood, that phrase, uh, set off by dashes, again, going between words. So that's the basic rule of thumb. Uh, you use a hyphen between tens and units numbers uh, when you write the numbers out using letters, so, uh, but only for numbers 21 to 99. So. 20 hyphen 1, 90 hyphen 9. Uh, you don't use hyphens in other numbers. So, for example, 256 to write be written correctly would be 2 space, 100 space, 50 hyphen 6. So, hyphens only between the tens and the units. Uh, similarly, fractions uh, are written out using a hyphen when the fraction is an adjective. If you think about it, if the fraction is a noun, then the numerator is really the noun. I'm sorry, the, uh, the denominator is the noun, and the numerator is an adjective modifying the noun. So, uh, if in this sentence, two-thirds of the Senate overrode the veto, here, thirds is the subject of the sentence. So, two modifies thirds. So there's no hyphen. However, if we said a two-thirds majority overrode the veto, um, here majority is the subject of the sentence, and two-thirds is an adjective modifying majority, so there the two-thirds would have the hyphen. We hyphenate uh, prefixes when they come before a proper noun or proper adjective. Those proper nouns and proper adjectives, of course, are capitalized, and so uh, the um, hyphen kind of emphasizes that there's a capital letter there. Uh, otherwise, it just looks unusual to have a capital letter in the middle of a word. So mid-June would be mid-June. Pre-Columbian. Columbian obviously comes from Columbus. Uh, so uh, a hyphen after the pre, same African-American, uh, same thing hyphen after uh, the first part of the word. Use a hyphen in words beginning with the prefixes all, x meaning former, and self, and in words ending with the suffix elect. So uh, self-propelled without the hyphen or extreme with the hyphen are incorrect. Uh, the prefix self needs the hyphen and the prefix in extreme does, doesn't mean former. So here are some you know, <laughs> positive examples. All-knowing, there's a hyphen. Ex-wife, meaning former wife, there's a hyphen. Self-propelled, uh, there's a hyphen. Mayor-elect, there's the hyphen. Extreme, no hyphen. Exacting, no hyphen. Expatriate, no hyphen. Um, <clears throat> I, I, I put expatriate down because uh, some students think the word expatriate uh, comes from literally the word patriot, uh, you know, a lover of one's country, or New England football team. Uh, and, uh, but uh, expatriate just means uh, away from one's homeland, uh, one who's living outside the country, and it comes from a Latin word, there's no hyphen there. Okay. Uh, some compound words are hyphenated uh, to basically to help us uh, see the words or pronounce them more clearly, especially uh, if they have um, a short 
word in the middle or the made up of uh, more than two words. Uh, so we have words like merry-go-round, editor-in-chief, uh, and those words are hyphenated. Uh, <coughs> if you're unsure about the hyphenation, you can look them up in a dictionary. Of course, word processors a lot of times uh, have those. And, and, and also, uh, sometimes um, terms like this will change. Uh, we see that sometimes technological terms, originally they may be hyphenated, and then eventually they're just combined into a single word. Uh, back in the uh, 19th century, for example, the word blackbird was usually hyphenated between the black and the bird. Uh, but, you know, since the late 19th century and into the 20th century, uh, you know, people dropped the hyphen. So, uh, you sometimes have to check for that. Um, hyphens will sometimes connect the words of a compound modifier that comes before the word being modified. Um, hyphens are not used this way with compound parts ending in ly, uh, and, or ones made up of proper nouns, proper adjectives. So, for example, he is a well-respected man. Uh, that well-respected uh, is usually, mo uh, usually um, hyphenated because well-respected is treated as a single word modifying man. However, if we said the man is well respected uh, in coming after the uh, verb here, it's, uh, uh, you could treat it either as a predicate adjective or you could treat it as a passive voice verb. In either way, uh, you don't hyphenate it there. Uh, now, some authorities do recognize the use of hyphenated compound adjective following the verb to be, uh, but usually that's if it's necessary for clarity talk about that a little bit. Um, so that was a badly punctuated sentence. In that case, we don't use the hyphen because the uh, adverb part of it ends in ly. Uh, we uh, wouldn't use, uh, for example, South American rainforest. Uh, we wouldn't hyphenate South America um, because it's a proper noun, unless the proper noun itself is hyphenated, you know, like you know, pre-Columbian or something like that. Okay, sometimes we put hyphens in words to clarify what word we're talking about, uh, especially if there are words that are spelled similarly, or if we don't include the hyphen, we might pronounce the word differently. So, for example, you sometimes see co-op with a hyphen, and you kind of need that so to distinguish it from coop. Um, and, uh, in fact, often uh, the word cooperative is spelled with a hyphen hyphen too. Re-elect is uh, spelled with a hyphen. Uh, again, um, just kind of like cooperative because uh, the uh, root begins with the same vowel that prefix ends with and um, it, you know, it helps with pronunciation. Uh, also, sometimes we use to distinguish between other words. Talk about reforming the clay pot. Instead of reform, which, you know, at least in modern English, means something a little different. And certainly, re-sign means something quite different from resign. In fact, if we talk about re-signing a contract, that would probably be the opposite of resigning a contract. So, uh, sometimes they do help us to distinguish between words. Um, sometimes uh, we use hyphens if it's not clear how the words are combined. For example, the guard captured five foot soldiers. Okay, is it soldiers who are five foot tall, or is it five foot soldiers, five infantrymen? Well, uh, you know, to make it clear, you know, we've put in the hyphen between foot and soldiers to show we're talking about foot soldiers. Uh, uh, <clears throat> once back in the 90s, um, a message posted on the internet uh, almost started a flame war because someone had. Uh, written uh, had posted, I resent your message. And the person that saw that was getting real upset and was thinking about ways that he could get even. And fortunately, a uh, person came back and said, I meant to say, I resent your message. Uh, very different. So again, that, that hyphen there made a difference. Okay, uh, you may recall that um, hyphens are 
sometimes used to divide words at the end of a line uh, when you know, the word doesn't fit entirely on the line. Uh, in most formal writing, it's better just not to do this. Uh, we do see it a lot of times in newspapers, but you know, newspaper columns uh, tend to be quite narrow. Um, and uh, also, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I found that um, I, I keep a blog and I use the Word pr WordPress uh, software to do that, and the WordPress software just, I don't know, they divide the words any way they want to, and, and there's not anything you can do about it because it's automatic. However, you know, if <laughs> you can follow the rules, this is the way uh, words ought to be divided. Again, it, it all just has to do with making it easier for the reader to understand what you're writing. So, divide the word between the syllables. Uh, obviously, one-syllable words won't be divided at all. So sports, you wouldn't divide because it's just one syllable. And support, you'd want to divide between the first syllable and the second syllable, in this case, between the two Ps, because you know, that is a lot more understandable because it's closer to the way we pronounce the word. Um, also, the hyphen goes at the end of the first line. The hyphen is, is like a number of other um, punctuation marks that never uh, begins a line. So, if you were dividing support, the hyphen would come after the first P not on the second line. Um, prefixes and suffixes make natural divisions, also make it easier for the reader to understand what it is you're saying. So, like as we did with support on the previous screen here, international, have the hyphen after the inter, in this case the prefix is inter, not in. Um, and also, there should be at least two letters plus the hyphen on the first line and three letters on the second line. If, if you can't do that, it's probably not worth dividing. Um, so, uh, for example, uh, elect just has you know, a single letter in the first syllable, and it's probably just not worth dividing it. Uh, here, supposedly, if you had to divide that, uh, you know, divide it between uh, the uh, first two syllables, uh, so, you're not, so you don't have just the two letters on the second line, because, hey, you know, uh, you know why bother? Okay, uh, normally we do not divide proper nouns or proper adjectives, uh, unless those proper nouns and proper adjectives are spelled with a hyphen anyhow. And we know some, some names of places, some names of people are hyphenated. Uh, so, um, again, again, in uh, any kind of formal English, you should avoid that. Also, if the word is hyphenated, then use the hyphen that's already there. So if you're dividing the word mother-in-law, you know, put it, you know, divide it after mother, after, uh, you know, where there's already a hyphen. No point in throwing in another hyphen, and that makes it just harder to read. Um, also, again, for the sake of your reader, uh, it's a good idea not to divide a word at the end of a line if the part, uh, if the second part of the word is on a separate page. Um, again, that just makes it harder to read, especially sometimes, in a, like in a newspaper, you have to, you know, you start on page one and then you have to go to page eight to find the rest of the article. So, it's just harder for the reader to follow, so you should avoid that. Okay, hyphens are also used to indicate a sequence of numbers, letters, or items in the list between the first and last items in the uh, sequence. Uh, usually, uh, the hyphen would represent the word through or the word to. So, we see this a lot of times with uh, people's milestone dates. Um, Abraham Lincoln, 1809 to 1865, born in 1809, died in 1865. Um, uh, you see this maybe on the uh, uh, title of uh, a book, you know, Volume 2, O through Z. Uh, okay, that, um, that tells us it you know, covers all letters, you know, all words of letters beginning with O through Z. Dictionary guide words, you know, at the top of a page of a dictionary will often have that. This is just a random page I found dictionary blazon to bless him. Okay, again, you have the hyphen indicating the uh, 
uh, sequence, the first and last item in the sequence. By the way, uh, <clears throat> I don't know if you realize this or not, but when uh, Frank L. Baum was writing his fantasy story, uh, he uh, was trying to come up with the name of his uh, fantasy land. And he happened to be working in an office, and one of the drawers on a file cabinet just was labeled O through Z. And he looked at that and said, that's a great name for my fantasy land, Oz. Okay, apostrophes are usually only used in a couple of cases, <laughs> but uh, strings oftentimes have problems with these, and they're hard to uh, uh, distinguish. So I'm going to go through quite a few um, rules concerning apostrophes. Okay, uh, apostrophe is normally used with the letter S to show ownership or possession. With most singular nouns, simply add an apostrophe plus the letter S to do this. And I want to emphasize, apostrophe plus S is never added to make a noun plural, even a proper noun. So, this is Joan's jacket. The jacket belongs to Joan. We're adding the S sound to show possession, not plural. So it's apostrophe S. He ate four hot dogs at the picnic. Their hot dogs is plural, more than one. So it's D-O-G-S, no apostrophe, because it's not possessive. Similarly, and this causes some students' problem, we saw the Smiths at the picnic. In more than one Smith, it's plural, it's not possessive, there is no apostrophe. Now, if a singular noun ends with an S, add an apostrophe S if the extra syllable is pronounced. If the extra syllable is not pronounced, or if it otherwise looks confusing, simply add an apostrophe. So, the dresses hem, apostrophe S, and that's the way we pronounce it. We, uh, make it possessive, we do add the syllable when we pronounce it. However, Lloyd Bridges' son the way we say that, we don't add an extra syllable when we pronounce it, so we just uh, spell it with the apostrophe, without apostrophe S. Yes. Uh, this is somewhat exceptional, but we do use it on occasion. Uh, some authorities always add an apostrophe to any word ending with an S. Uh, I would avoid this. Most authorities don't do that. Um, and it can be confusing to the reader. Uh, and, uh, but I, I just mentioned that in case you come across something that says, you know, the dress is him, and there's just an apostrophe without the S. Uh, now, to make most nouns plural, you add an S, and, uh, or sometimes you add an ES, and you ES, add an ES to words that end an S sound, a Z sound, an SH or CH sound. Um, but again, you don't use an apostrophe if you're just making them plural. So lands, you just add an S. Dresses, you add an ES. Taxes ends with an S sound, you add an ES. Quizzes adds, ends with a Z sound, you add an ES. Bushes with an ES. Coaches with an ES. Uh, so 20 dogs were in the park. Again, no apostrophe. It's just a plural dog. Or 20 dogs were in the pack. Sorry about that. Uh, to make a plural noun possessive, you simply add an apostrophe uh, to the word. If the plural does not end in S, then you add an apostrophe S. So, for example, the girls' dresses. Okay, uh, the dresses belonging to the girls. Okay, we don't say the girls' dresses, we just say the girls. So, you add S apostrophe. That's, that's kind of when you have the apostrophe without the S. And, you know, most standard uh, English. So, the Wilson's house. You know, the house belongs to the Wilson, where the Wilsons live. Again, Wilsons is plural. You add the apostrophe after the S. Obviously, it's something like the men's room. Uh, yeah, men is plural, but it, it's not a plural that ends with an S. So then you add the apostrophe S to show the pronunciation. 
Uh, this uh, next one is probably something you kind of we kind of recognize in English uh, intuitively, but I just want to uh, repeat this for you for um, that it, to show that more than one person share the same item together. You make the only the last owner in the series possessive. For example, Ken and Larry's ice cream. Uh, there's a brand of ice cream that sounds very similar, made by two men, but it's one ice cream, so you know the. Apostrophe S just comes at the last name. John and Mary's pet cats. John and Mary own the cats together. Uh, they share the cats. But if there are similar items owned individually by different owners, then you make each owner possessive. Uh, so, for example, if you said John's and Mary's pet cats, that would be John had a cat or cats and Mary had a cat or cats and they were separate cats. They weren't the same cat, so we buy both of them. Okay, apostrophes with pronouns can cause a challenge for some people. For indefinite pronouns, possessive forms, same as ordinary nouns. So somebody's child, apostrophe yes. Another's idea, apostrophe yes. But I do want to emphasize this. Personal pronouns, including it, do not have any apostrophes for their possessives. Hers, theirs, yours. No apostrophe. Those are all incorrect. So it's his, hers, it's ours, yours, theirs, whose. No apostrophe. If it helps, and this always helped me, I remember that his doesn't take apostrophes. And neither do any of the other possessive forms of any of those pronouns. Now, what uh, perhaps is a little bit confusing is the word its, with apostrophe yes, does exist. And whose, with an apostrophe S, does exist, but they're contractions since they have different meaning. It's with the apostrophe S means it is or it has, and whose, with the apostrophe S, means you know, who is or who has. So, yeah, they exist, but they're not the possessive personal pronouns. What's a grammar rule without exceptions? Okay. <clears throat> It's been common for cartographers, map makers, to ignore the apostrophe for possessive names, names of geographical features, and you know even streets. Um, and that is really because map making goes back even before the invention of the printing press, before people worried about um, punctuation rules, and uh, so. Uh, most of the time, say on maps or on place names, you will see a name without the apostrophe. And this is true in both the British Isles and in North America. So in, in most cases, the locality uses the cartographer's um, way of doing it. So we, Fisher's Island, there, uh, there is no uh, apostrophe yes for, uh, af after Fisher. Pike's Peak, yeah, it's named after Zebulon Pike, but there is no apostrophe because it's a geographic name. Martha's Vineyard is an exception. <laughs> and there's a story behind that. Uh, um, Martha's Vineyard, at least on the maps, uh, used to not have the apostrophe S, um, although most residents of Martha's Vineyard wrote it with the apostrophe S. And in the 1930s, um, uh, the uh, people of Martha's Vineyard, gov uh, government there, actually petitioned the uh, geological survey to uh, include the apostrophe in Martha's Vineyard because that's the way most people spelled it. So, uh, you know, there, there are a few exceptions. I don't know, maybe a handful, maybe four or five exceptions to this, and Martha's Vineyard happens to be one of them. Okay. Apostrophes with italicized or underlined items. You might recall from our lesson on underlining or italicizing that letters, numbers, symbols, and words naming themselves are italicized or underlined. If you want to make those plural, you add an apostrophe S. It's the only time in standard written English where apostrophe S refers to a plural. And I guess the reason they do that is the apostrophe kind of separates the plural from the item that's underlined. In fact, 
the apostrophe S is not italicized or underlined. So don't forget to dot your I's. Okay. Um, I italicized apostrophe S. His sevens look like twos. Again, we're using the number as a number. Um, so again, we would use apostrophe S. His ampersands look like eights. Same idea. Um, I find the these and thous in older writing hard to follow. Okay. Again, uh, we're talking about the word the and the word thou. Uh, they're made plural, so they are uh, made plural by adding the apostrophe S. Okay, some authorities make acronyms or year dates plural by adding apostrophes. For example, some places you'll see the 1960s with an apostrophe S. Um, and uh, this is fairly common with dates. Uh, you sometimes see this in the case with acronyms and abbreviations. Um, now, your grammar texts and other authorities don't recognize this rule, especially with abbreviations, because that can be confusing. For example, uh, DA is a common uh, acronym abbreviation for district attorney. Um, now, DAs without the apostrophe would mean more than one district attorney, or DAs with the apostrophe would refer to something belonging to the district attorney. Um, and, uh, and so if we say DAs with the apostrophe, we're talking about like the DA's office, something like that. Now, uh, to avoid confusion or you're not sure um, which rule your particular uh, <clears throat> uh, people you're writing for use, uh, just write out the words the 60s or the district of attorney's office. I mean, that's one way to kind of avoid that issue. But, um, you do sometimes see that with apostrophes. Okay. Uh, the other thing besides possessives that apostrophes are uh, used for uh, generally are contractions. The apostrophes show uh, letters that are left out of contractions. Uh, most contractions are with verbs. Talk about a few that aren't later. Most of them are with verbs and usually in one of five situations. Verbs with not are contracted. You know, aren't, don't, isn't, and so on. Uh, the word won't is a contraction of will not. Um, will, uh, in older times, was often spelled with an O, and that became uh, standard for the contraction. Shan't, uh, not real common in North America, um, but, you know, is uh, the contraction for shall not. Uh, a lot of times, um, pronouns with will uh, are contracted to apostrophe L. I'll, you'll, he'll, and so on. Now, in conversation, will is often slurred, and so if you're showing dialogue, uh, you may uh, sometimes see uh, apostrophe LL after a name, like John will come home soon. Okay, in other words, John will come home soon. Uh, again, if, if you're writing it out, uh, if you're not quoting dialogue, you would just write out will. Um, Pronouns and nouns with the verb to be. You remember the verb to be, uh, words like uh, you know is, am, are, was, were, um, have been, has been, and so on. Um, so I'm your who's that is who is uh, he she's and uh, we are there and so on. Now again in conversation the word is is uh, often contracted with nouns um, because, uh, again, the way we pronounce it. So a lot of times first we hear someone say, instead of saying Martha is here, it's kind of uh, contracted. We say Martha's here. And so sometimes you will see that uh, not only with pronouns but with uh, other nouns as well. Now, uh, I want to note four confusing trans uh, contractions. Who's, it's, your, and their. Uh, remember, the apostrophe indicates letters have been left out. So, who's with the apostrophe S means who is or who has. Your with the apostrophe RE means you are. It's with the apostrophe S means it is or it has. There with the apostrophe RE is they are. Um, 
and also just a reminder of the possessive of who is whose, W-H-O-S-E. So who's coming with me, that's the contraction, who is. Uh, so that's the apostrophe yes, whereas whose book is this, um, you know, that's the possessive personal pronoun, W-H-O-S-E. Uh, yeah, please understand that. But if you understand the way contractions operate, you know, this should be clear. Okay, pronouns with the verb to have. I've, he's, you've, we've, they've. Um, sometimes the word have is slurred, especially after verbs like would, could, and should. And in dialogue, this is often shown as apostrophe V-E. Shouldn't use O-F of, because, you know, that's just a different word that means something totally different. So, um, uh, instead of saying we would have liked to have gone, and we should say, we would have liked to have gone, uh, to show that the, um, you know, that it's not of, it's have contracted. Also, uh, notice with, especially with like and suppose, a lot of times those words are followed by the word to, but most of the time um, it's really liked or supposed with a D. I just, just mentioned that because that's a spelling problem that some students have. So. Uh, obviously, in any more formal writing, you would write out the word. You would say, we would have liked to have gone. Uh, pronouns with would or had contracted uh, would uh, are shown with apostrophe D. You know, I'd better go. I had to better go. He'd want to go. He would want to go. Uh, again, in everyday conversation, the words would or had are often slurred and maybe showed as... Uh, apostrophe D following a noun in dialogue, like John would be upset if he found out. I mean, uh, again, in, in dialogue, we often pronounce it that way rather than say John would. Now, when writing about years, insert an apostrophe where numbers are dropped, like the winter of 65, the 96 Olympics. And also, in a few uh, words and some names, O apostrophe, D apostrophe, L apostrophe, and T apostrophe, indicate abbreviate, abbreviated forms of the word the or of in various languages. So, like, um, you know, o'clock is of the clock. Okay, but we just say of clock or o'clock. And so we uh, put the um, apostrophe in to show the contraction. Uh, L'enfant. Uh, Plaza, Washington, D.C. Uh, the designer was a Mr. L'Enfant, and uh, in French there was uh, a letter left out, so they showed the apostrophe to show the letter left out. Um, P.J. O'Rourke, again O'Rourke, uh, in showing uh, letters that are uh, left out. Uh, usual rule for compound last names begin with an article or preposition, except for O, and various forms of Mac, is to capitalize the article or preposition if it's not, uh, if it's not used with the first name, but lowercase if it is used with the first name. So we see court and ten boom, there ten uh, is not capitalized um, because it's with her first name, but if we said miss ten boom, then uh, it would be capitalized because there's no first name. So would be von Beethoven the von is not capitalized, whereas von Ryan's express, it is capitalized because there's no first name there. Now, some families, especially in North America, where uh, there isn't this tradition of nobility, um, they may want to capitalize all parts of the name. This is common in English-speaking countries. So, um, for example, baseball player Johnny Vandermeer, um, he always capitalized the van. In fact, he put the Vander as a single word. In, in Dutch, it probably would be three words, uh, and the van and the der would uh, not be capitalized. Okay, sometimes to show pronunciation and dialogue, a uh, word is contracted to show missing letters. Uh, avoid this in formal writing, except in quotations, even when the contraction is a more accurate representation. So, uh, for example, you know, sometimes you see, particularly in comics, see C apostrophe M O N for come on. Uh, Lil Abner, in fact, this was spelled wrong, this should be L-I apostrophe L. -I -L. Uh, Lil Abner, um, or Little Abner, is a comic strip that's uh, made into a musical at one point. Um, sometimes you'll see folksal written one of these ways, 
Um, it looks like forecastle, but it's pronounced forecastle. Uh, the same with gunnel. Okay, that rhymes with funnel, but it's, it's spelled gunwale. But sometimes you'll see it with the apostrophe to indicate the way it's pronounced. Um, but uh, again, I would avoid contracting these words except in dialogue. Now, we do have some other uh, punctuation marks that have a few uses. The ellipses is three periods in a row. It usually signifies that words or figures are missing. Uh, it's used with quotations to show that words have been left out from the original quotation. And in mathematics, ellipsis is used to show that numbers have been left out. Um, and we'll give you some examples. Here's the original quotation from Ray Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451. Now, here's that same quotation with an ellipsis. Like, you want to emphasize the uncle, so you leave out part of the middle, so it always used to be that way. My uncle says no, ellipsis, and then it continues with the quotation. Um, sometimes you have the ellipsis at the end uh, to show that it's the end of the quotation. Um, there should be some quotation marks there. I apologize for that. Okay, um, and then sometimes you have uh, an ellipsis at the beginning to show, again, words at the beginning of the sentence or something you left out. Police said her uncle remembered when children didn't kill each other. Okay, um, now, uh, sometimes some authorities use a fourth period if uh, a paragraph or more has been left out. Uh, so... You sometimes see that. Okay, sometimes in a narrative, an ellipsis shows a pause. Okay, here, in my, my office, uh, or, or in narration, you know, what does a minister of recreation do anyway? Uh, so, um, that, you sometimes see that used in uh, narrative, whether it's in dialogue or in telling a story. Obviously, in mathematics, uh, we use the ellipsis to show there are numbers left out. For example, pi equals 3.14159, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, by the way, just in case you're curious, the plural of ellipsis is ellipses, which follows that S-I-S spelling rule. Okay, brackets, sometimes called crotchets, are always used in pairs to mark off material inserted into a quotation, which is not part of of the original quotation. Should limit this, but uh, you know, it's used to uh, clarify things um, uh, to, you know, to help the reader. Now, the Latin word sick, S-I-C, which means thus or so, is often put in brackets to indicate a misspelling or grammatical problem or other misuse of language in the original quotation. That kind of covers yourself to say, uh, I didn't misspell this. That, that's the original way they spelled it. So, uh, here's an example of an editorial insertion. Uh, Tell me, heavenly bow, if Venus or her son, as thou dost know, does, do now attend the queen. And, you know, if you're explaining this, you're not sure um, which of Venus's sons they're talking about, because she had a lot of them. Uh, put Cupid in brackets to show it's referring to Cupid. That's not in the original, but it helps clarify. Uh, and then sick is probably most commonly used in brackets to show this you might recognize from Great Expectations, uh, when Pip is learning to write but hasn't really learned to spell yet. Um, and so we throw in a sick to show this is the way it is in the original. Brackets are also used in uh, dictionaries, glossaries, and word lists to show word origins. So if you see brackets, and then <laughs> followed by uh, L in brackets, that means it originally comes from the Latin and occasionally used to show parenthetical information uh, for things that are already in parentheses. Uh, you should avoid this, not everybody recognizes this, but uh, it can be helpful. So, for example, if you had this statement in parentheses and you wanted to include his years, you, know, you put those in brackets. Um, it's also sometimes done in math that way, too. Um, want to just mention certain punctuation marks never begin a line. This includes all closing punctuation marks that come in pairs, closing parenthesis, closing brackets, closing quotation mark, closing single quotation marks, uh, end marks, uh, 
period, comma, question mark, exclamation point, colon, semicolon, never begin a line, hyphens, uh, never begin a line, dashes normally don't begin a line unless they're used to indicate a change of speaker. Um, so, uh, similarly, certain punctuation marks never end a line. This includes all opening paired punctuation marks, like opening uh, parentheses, opening brackets, opening quotation marks, opening single quotation marks, and you place those at the beginning of the following line. So, um, you know, you say, John said, okay, if that was the end of the line, you'd have the comma at the end of the line, but you'd have the uh, opening quotation marks at the beginning of the next line. Uh, the virgule uh, in computer talk is often called the slant bar, has four specific uses in punctuation. It separates parts of an extended date. Uh, George Washington was born February 1731-1732. Uh, Virgil represents the word per in abbreviations or measurements. Uh, you know, uh, 186,000 miles per second. A Virgil stands for the word or in the expression and or. You know, you're welcome to bring pets and or children to, you know, whatever. Uh, not, not always considered standard, sometimes stands for the word or in other expressions, especially if those expressions are made up of uh, more than one word. Uh, so most of the time you can see either or separated by uh, a hyphen, but if you talk about he said, she said clauses as we did earlier, you would separate those by a Virgil. Um, it's interesting. I had one, one book that says, only use the Virgil for and, or, don't use for anything else, and yet that same source uses a Virgil when they talk about he said, she said clauses uh, in writing. So uh, it kind of shows that that, that has, becoming, uh, has become a practice, even if people don't always consider it standard. Um, Virgil separates lines of poetry that are quoted run-on fashion in the text. My recommendation is to avoid this. Um, certainly if you have more than four lines, uh, you have to write them out line by line, but uh, sometimes you'll see it done this way, and up and down the people go Virgil, gazing where the lilies blow, etc., and the Virgil show that the poetry those will be new lines. Now, why do some dates use a Virgil? The Virgil represents the word or in some dates. Why is George Washington's birth year, or birth, you know, so it's February 1731, Virgil 1732. I mean, he could have only been born in one year. Well, that has to do with the change in the calendar. During the rule of Julius Caesar, Romans adopted the calendar with leap years. This became known as the Julian calendar. By the year 1582, the calendar was over 10 days off, so Pope Gregory II changed the calendar slightly to account for this difference by skipping the leap day in three of the four century years. He did this because, uh, um, and then, um, you know, the religious holidays had been off. And then also, uh, under the Roman practice, the uh, first day of the new year was March 15th, was the Ides of March. Remember that from Julius Caesar. Um, Gregory uh, adopted January 1st as the beginning of the new year to correspond to the Christmas season and the birth of Jesus. So this meant that people born or events that happened in the first two and a half months of the Gregorian year happened at the end of the Julian year. Now, not all countries adopted the Gregorian calendar right away. England and its colonies didn't ad uh, adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1752. Uh, until then, January, February, and the first two weeks of March still belonged to the old year. So when George Washington was born, the records that were written said he was born February 11th, 1731. However, in 1752, when uh, England and its colonies adopted the Gregorian calendar, that meant Washington's birthday under the new system was February 22nd, and it was 1732, because now the year began the 1st of January. They added 11 days to make up the time lost over the years, and they recalculated the year's first day to January 1st. So that's why, um, especially uh, in um, uh, genealogies and things like that, you'll sometimes see dates that look like this. 
George Washington was born in 1731-1732. Or Ben Franklin's birthday was January 6th or 17th, 1705 or 1706. Uh, and, and most of the time you'll find that it has to do with something that happened in the first two and a half months of the year. Um, for what it's worth, uh, Russia didn't adopt the Gregorian calendar until 1918. Uh, that's why the Red October Revolution began on November 7th. Well, if it's Red October, why did it begin on November 7th? Well, because in Russia in 1917, that was still October 24th. Um, uh, angle brackets are a relatively new punctuation mark. Uh, like square brackets, they're always paired. Um, and they're the same as the less than or greater than marks on the keyboard. They began to use, uh, be used in certain computer languages and have been used in ordinary English prose to set apart URLs such as this. Um, so we may show the URL for English Plus uh, and the URL be set off by angle brackets. That's about the only time uh, it's used in, in standard uh, English uh, nowadays. Uh, who knows, that may change in the future. Uh, again, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them in class. Uh, if you're not a member of the class, uh, you know, go to the contact page of EnglishPlus.com and someone will be happy to answer your question. Thank you very much for your time.